we've been in a series on, in the book of Romans, and uh, to God be the glory, we are continuing to uh, journey through it. We are turning a corner now. Romans 5 through 8 is where I'd like to go. Uh, Romans chapter 5 today, and I'd like to end our, our first session at Romans chapter 8. So to God be the glory, I hope we do so. And um, Romans chapter 5, we're going to be in verse 1, but it's critical for you to understand how God works. And I think Paul is just beating the drum of justification. So we're just going to repeat what we repeated last week again. Uh, everyone at the sound of my voice at all three of our locations today say this. Say, I am justified by faith. Come on, one more time. I am justified by faith. One more time. I am justified by faith. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by what? Praise be to God. You didn't have to justify yourself. Christ himself justified us on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Since you, we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Thank you for your peace. We won't get far today in today's sermon beyond peace with God, but I'm going to read you some more verses just to give you some more context. But we will be landing and staying on what it means to have peace with God. Through him, verse 2, we have also obtained access. Come on, somebody. You didn't have to have a key to get in here today. You already have access by faith into this grace which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What great theology we have in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We are both weak and ungodly, but God knew what he was doing when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait on you. He didn't wait on you to clean your act up. He didn't wait on you to get it all together. He didn't wait on you to come to your senses. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. While we were still ungodly and weak, at the right time, Christ died for us. Is there any better message in the fact that we can lean into not having to behave our way out of the wickedness that we found ourselves in? We don't have to perform our way out behaviorally, but instead we can receive the adoption of this new identity because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been we have now been, not by our own blood, not by the blood of bulls and goats or pigeons, not by the blood of sacrifices, but by the ultimate sacrifice, his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that redeems us and saves us from the wrath of God. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, we serve a much more God. Now that we are reconciled, we shall we be saved by his life. And then I love this verse 11, more than that. <laughs> it doesn't stop at salvation. It doesn't stop at the cross. He still loves you and cares for you at a greater measure than you even understand. More than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Man, that, that's a, we could go home now. Like literally, I just feel like we should take the offering and dismiss. There is enough meat on that bone to eat for a few days.
We've been reconciled, justified, and peace has been made with God. I'd like to talk to you today about how the war between you and God is over. And peace has been made between you and God. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. What a friendly reminder. Oh, man, that we are not slaves. We are sons. And that this isn't about behavior modification. It is about re-identification, learning who we are in you. And we receive the justification by faith. There's nothing we could do to earn it, nothing we could do to deserve it. But by God, you sent it and we receive it and we accept the gift of your grace today. Thank you for this masterful, theological, yet also very spiritual and practical insight that we have peace with God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Anybody grow up in church? Anybody just grow up in church? Uh, if you didn't, we're glad you're here. Um, you make us better because if you grew up in church and it was only a bunch of church folks here, then we'd have this uh, self-righteous buffet of theology and never remind ourselves how it used to be. I grew up in church. I was in church nine months before I was born. Uh, my appetizer for lunch at Chili's was always the leftover, the communion bread on communion Sunday. And uh, I would drink the juice too. Thank God it wasn't real wine because your boy would have been eight years old and feeling nice at Chili's. I've taken more naps under pews than I can recall. I've Swam in the baptismal tank after baptism Sunday because I thought it was cool. My parents were talking what seemed, for what seemed like forever in the lobby. And uh, one of the things that you'll find when someone is seasoned or mature or followed God for a long time, for this is for the older Christian, uh, if they've been marinating in the goodness of God for a long time, I have one, I'll pose one question to you as you were growing up in church. How many times did you get saved? How many times did the evangelist come to town with the RV sitting outside in the church parking lot and preach a message how heaven's sweet and hell is hot? And if you don't get up here to the altar right now and you were like, I thought I was saved, but now I'm not. You know, he convinced you that you were not saved. Maybe you haven't been following Christ long enough, but there is this tendency, this trend, this model to get stuck in trespassing over the elementary, rudimentary things of salvation to the point of never accepting full justification. When you don't understand justification, you keep yourself in this cycle of unbelief if you are really saved or not. So every time someone says, you know, hellfire and brimstone, you feel like I'm not saved and I have to repeat the prayer again. Justification allows you to have peace and assurance that you are saved and that God is good and that it's done once and for all. As a matter of fact, the original language, the word justification is not a um, like in any tense that would be in the past. Or the present, it was, it was permanent. It's, it's permanent tense. Like you have been justified and nothing you do or say can, be, uh, can change that justification. Now, I want to define justification and then I want to talk about peace. Are you good with that today? Let me teach you just a little bit and then I'll get a little preachy towards the very end. Justification defined. Justification is the act of God whereby he forgives the unsaved person's sins and imputes credits and signs to them the righteousness of Christ when through faith they believe. So you no longer put on your own righteousness because how's that working out for you? Not good. A lot of holes in that argument and you to be your self-righteous self. Instead, you are now being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. This is good news. And I've said this, I think, verse every single sermon during this series. But the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. We've been justified by faith through Christ so that we can receive this righteousness. And that's good news. It's very good news. 
Because of this justification, it just doesn't stop at us thanking God that we're saved. We can also begin to thank God that we have peace with him. Now, there's difference between having peace with God and experiencing the peace of God. Okay? And I'm going to break down the difference because I think a lot of times we pray for the peace of God when we need to establish a foundation that we already have peace with God. Peace with God, if you're taking notes today. Peace with God is not psychedelic, yo. It's not inter-tranquility. Peace with God is not good vibes, dude. Peace with God is not sending you positive thoughts, T's and P's. Thoughts and prayers is what that stands for. <laughs> this peace with God is not finding your center on the yoga mat at the hot yoga studio. Right. This peace with God is not you um, grounding yourself by taking off your shoes and, and, and walking on the ground. This is not emotional based peace. It's evidence-based peace. Peace of God and peace with God are two different things. And peace with God is not emotional. It's established. It's, it's uh, robust. It's thorough. It's thick. It's, it, cannot be, uh, it cannot waver nor be shaken. Justification by faith brings us in to peace with God that you can't change. It's, it's not peace as a feeling. It's peace as a foundation. I won't let peace of God be the primary driver to how I respond to him. I'll let peace with God be my foundation as to how I respond to him. Because peace with God is a firm foundation. It, it, it declares that the war for my soul is over. Whenever you have two countries fighting, then they have peace. It's not a feeling. It's a truce. It's, it's evidence-based. It's we are no longer at war with God. I am standing on justification by faith, and I'm standing that the righteousness of Christ I am clothed in. The problem with many of us is, is we were never taught this, so we stay wondering if we're saved or not. We're at peace with God, but we don't know it. And we definitely aren't living like it. So you get saved every time there's an altar call because you haven't established this foundation of peace that is required. See, feelings are the symptoms, but they are not the source of peace with God. I will not let emotional peace drive. When I let emotional peace drive, I, 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 I tend to go on how I feel. But my feelings can ride, but they cannot drive. Does this make sense? Because if I let my feelings drive, guess where I'm going? To the buffet. <laughs> guess where I'm going? To places I shouldn't go. Guess what I'm thinking? Things I shouldn't think. But when I know that I'm at peace with God, then my, my firm foundation of justification drives and my feelings ride in the back seat. So instead of getting peace from how you feel, the more mature you are, you get peace from what you know. I've trained my mind to know I'm, I'm okay. I have assurance of salvation. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, but it means I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and let the devil convince me that I'm not saved. I'm not gonna sit here and, and I mean, I grew up in, y'all should, I'm part of, a product of the system, man. My, my mom read Left Behind right before bed. You don't even know what Left Behind is, but it's a, it's a, a series of books. I just want, it's a series of books. Nikolai Carpathia was the Antichrist in that book. Y'all think I'm crazy. We were. I mean, right before, right before bedtime, every single night, if God came back tonight, where would you be? I got saved every night. 
There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having the fear of the Lord. But the problem is, is if the fear of the Lord keeps you just at experiencing salvation, he has much more for you. He has greater things in you. But you can't have the peace of God until you have peace with God. (laughs) So let's stop the cycle of getting saved and let's start the cycle of understanding I've been justified. I got the righteousness of Christ and I don't have to play games. I have assurance of salvation. Man, you don't have to go to the altar every time there's a salvation call. If you, if you really knew justification and you really understood righteousness, then you wouldn't need to. Because your new identity would overtake your, the lie of the enemy that he's trying to tell you. This is not peace of God. This is peace with God. Are you with me? This is the kind of peace I'm talking about. Isaiah 9, 6. You've heard this before, uh, maybe at a Christmas service or something. For, uh, for, to us, a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of of what? This is not emotional peace. This is This is establishment peace. This is government peace. This is I rule and I reign. And if you are at peace with me, you have it or you don't have it. It's not whether you feel it or not. There will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Doesn't feel. It's firm. It's robust, it's thick, it's foundational, it's critical. I have peace with God. Because I have peace with God, I can experience the peace of God. So you cannot have the peace of God until you have peace with God. Now here's a verse for the peace of God, in case you're wondering what the difference is. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That peace only comes when you know who you are. You can't pray for the peace of God without having peace with God. Are you with me? The longer I pastor, the more I realize that most Christians don't understand the difference. So they walk, they live their life on eggshells, wondering if they're saved or not. They haven't understood justification by faith. The enemy loves to get you to second guess your peace with God so that you'll continually retrace your steps of salvation instead of embracing a life of sanctification. So if he can just keep you barely saved, you guys know, you've been there before. If he can just keep you barely saved, you'll never step into the full measure of grace that he has for you. So you always think, I'm not saved. And if the enemy can get you to think you're not saved, then he can get you to never step into the fullness and embrace sanctification, which is a relationship with God. That's why many of you have a false sense of peace and your time with God tends to be a list of failures and regrets from the last week. An immature person just prays all of their woulda, coulda, shoulda, and never and just embraces their new identity as a son or daughter of the king. Your time with God is full of concerns of what you were and what you weren't, and what I was and what I wasn't. But I came to preach to somebody today that you are a son and a daughter of the king, and he's not really interested in hearing. He knows. He's fully aware. He's trying to get you outside of that so that you establish assurance of justification and reassurance of salvation so that he can move forward with you in relationship. I didn't know this. This is fresh revelation, but this is, this is I'm a product of a system that made you scared. And you never, got, you never got above the fear of not being saved. But Paul is very clear that because we have been justified, we have peace with God. There's nothing we could do to buy it. Especially here in the West. There are some red flags of false peace that I'd like to give you. Red flags of false peace. All the kids have these red flags emoji. You know, they're like, red flag, you know, red flag this, red flag that. I'm not sure, I'm not a kid, but... That's what they say, you know, red flags of false peace. This is a false peace. This isn't real. This is false peace. Number one is false peace takes sin lightly. If you don't, 
have a real sense of justification, then you just kind of sin and then heal yourself. You feel like you're bulletproof to sin. Well, I, 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 know, I know this isn't right, but grace. I, I know I'm wrong right now, but the blood. <laughs> I know I shouldn't be doing this, but Christ. That's not real justification, and that's not real peace with God. You take sin too lightly. It says in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Stop ripping open the seal. You've been redeemed. So stop taking sin lightly. If you knew the price that was paid for on the cross, then you wouldn't be casual with your sin. It has nothing to do with behavior modification. It has to do, because I'm a son, I don't want to do those things anymore. Because I've embraced this new identity of adoption, I have no desire to sin. If you're taking sin lightly right now, and you know you shouldn't be doing that, you know you shouldn't be doing that, it's because you have a false sense of peace. You really don't have peace with God. People who have peace with God look at sin and say, that will remove the peace, that will, that will get me further away from peace with God. I don't want anything to do with that. Sanctification is the process by which you, you, you don't keep peace with God. He already made peace with God. By which you walk out the peace with God that he gave you. To take sin too lightly, red flag. Red flag. I know I shouldn't be going to the bar, but. I know I'm not legally divorced yet, but we really love each other. So we're going to go ahead and move in together with a new husband or new wife. Don't take sin lightly. You're abusing the grace that came from Jesus Christ. That's actually exposing your, your immaturity. You'll find no mature believer takes sin lightly. <laughs> Another red flag of false peace is false peace talk about God casually. I can really tell if somebody walks with God or not by how they call God out. They say, big man upstairs. <laughs> big man upstairs. What about Holy Spirit that guides me and, and leads me? What about, what about the one who walked with Adam in the cool of the day? Like big man upstairs, have you met God? So too many times we use casual names for God. Casual, we're casual about the presence of God. That's why you walk in here late with a coffee. You're too casual about God. If you knew the God we were worshiping, this, these seven seats right here would be full. It's not here to worship me. Don't get casual about God. That's false peace. That's right. Big man upstairs going to take care of me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't lose reverence. Right. I got peace with God. And the longer I follow him, the more reverent I want to be. False peace. Take God casually. You hear people say, oh, I'm, I'm a believer. I believe. Even the demons believe and tremble. So don't talk about God casually. You better have a relationship with him intimately. It is intimacy that he is after. Casual relationship, is that's idol. That's idol worship. That's the American way to be just Christian enough. You're going to make it to heaven, but you'll smell like hell when you get there. Because you're just so casual, you just won't step into peace with God and justification. Instead, you just always get saved on Easter, always get saved on Christmas, and only come to church when your mom tells you you should. You talk about God casually. You know just enough to talk about God with another Christian, but if you and I were talking, you'd get real nervous. Because once you encounter a, a, someone who's walked with God and a theologian who understands, you're a big man upstairs, nothing. He does not care about the football team's score. He's not watching out for the Panthers. I wish he would. False, false peace talks about God casually because they don't know him intimately. And then number three, false peace is only interested in forgiveness, not righteousness. So they only come to church when they've sinned. They only pray when they sin. They only commune with God when they have, some, they have repentance to handle. When you have peace with God, you, you, you repent, but then you move towards righteousness. It's not just some uh, confession. This is not confession. <laughs> this is relationship. You get access. He even said it. You get access to the grace. 
Therefore, since you have been justified by faith, you now have peace with God. This is not some transaction. I know many of you might have grown up in a Catholic household or a Catholic upbringing. This is not that. They tend to focus on the tradition and the transaction. Here, we focus on relationship and identity. And once you receive your identity, then you're no longer, you're no longer just going to your dad for forgiveness. You're going to your dad for relationship. I don't just go to my father when I did something wrong. I want to spend time with him. I want righteousness. That's the difference. That's the difference. All right. So we know false peace takes sin lightly. False peace talk about God casually. And false peace is only interested in forgiveness and not righteousness. So what does this peace do? Peace with God puts you at rest with assurance. Are you learning anything today? Okay. Peace with God is a firm foundation that is assurance. I know who I am because of whose I am. That's assurance. I'm not prideful. I just am secure in knowing Christ died for me. My faith is so strong that I can stand rest assured. See, I don't think you can lose your salvation. I do think you can leave it. And since I'm not leaving it, I'm going to be rest assured in it. And I'm going to pursue righteousness every single day of my life. Romans 8, 38, 39. I hope we get there by the end of the summer series. But it says this, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, n- death, depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am rest assured. I can walk confidently as a son of God. I will not take him lightly. I will not take sin uh, loosely. I will, I will instead pursue righteousness because of what he did for me through his son on the cross. Peace with God puts you at rest with assurance. Number two, peace puts the enemy to shame. You want to know what makes the enemy nervous? Is when you are so secure in your identity in Christ that you can filter a lie from the enemy very quickly. Being able to distinguish what's, what brings peace with God and what the enemy is trying to convince you of, knowing that's a lie. That's not of God. That's not of God. That's, that's, not, that's not righteous. That's wicked. That's evil. And what the enemy loves to do is to convince you that God didn't really say what he said. It was his first lie. The first thing he did in Adam and Eve, he said, did God really say? Once you have peace with God, you can turn back to the enemy and say, actually, he did. <laughs> yeah, he did say. He did say, I am saved. He did say, I am the righteousness of God. He did say, I am his son. I am his daughter. He did say, he did say. Yes, he did, as a matter of fact. But many of us who don't have peace with God, the enemy says, did God really say? And you're like, hmm, I need to do some research. And you go back to the library of your own strength, the Rolodex of your own thoughts, the Rolodex of your own effort, the, the, the bank of your own self, And you will never be able to satisfy what the enemy is asking of you in the form of a lie. Because you have to understand this. It puts the devil to shame when you know who you are. If Eve would have looked right back at the serpent and said, yeah, God really did say, don't eat of this fruit. Don't eat of this tree. Instead, she said, oh, I want to be like God. Maybe I do want to be like God. It puts the devil to shame when you have peace with God. And John, you can come to close. Peace, number three, peace puts your fear of death in the grave. I'm not afraid to die because I got peace with God. If I do a hospital visit towards the end of someone's life, sometimes they get nervous. I'm nervous to die. I don't know if I'm right with God. You've been justified. You have assurance. I'm no longer afraid to die. Do I want to die? Not today, but if I did, my funeral would be full of the assurance of my salvation. 
That's why it puts the, it puts the fear of death to the grave. I, 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 if you go to a Christian's funeral, they are not afraid. I've been at funerals where the outcome was unknown. And you can sense the fear in the atmosphere. As a preacher, whenever the, the outcome is unknown, whether that person had been justified by, by their faith or not, I just have to preach them to the pearly gates and leave them there. Then I have to say, well, if Johnny was alive right now, I can tell you this, he'd, he'd say heaven is real. He'd say hell is real. Don't make me have to preach that kind of funeral. Let me take you all the way through the pearly gates, dancing on the streets of gold, surfing on the sea of glass. When you have assurance and peace with God, you don't have to worry about death. It says in Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. If you are afraid to die today, you are a slave. You are a slave if you are afraid to die. I am not afraid to die today. Take me out because I know where I stand. Nothing I did, nothing I could do, but I believe by faith in what Christ did on the cross and I have peace with God. Have you ever watched a, a scary movie? I wasn't allowed to growing up. But I've been delivered. Just, just kidding. You ever watch a movie that has like jump cuts, like real scary scenes or just like even like intense movies that just like out of nowhere, a car crash happens or out of nowhere, the bad guy shows up, you know, the Sally's just opening up her fridge and all of a sudden it's like, Ping! you know, and you jump the first time you watch the movie, you're like, <gasps> you know, what's more fun than watching the movie for the first time <laughs> is watching it for the second time, but with someone who's watching it for the first time. Because you know how the story goes, <laughs> but they don't. So you don't even warn them. But you know in your mind, you're like, I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to happen. And you watch them and they jump. And you don't jump because you've already seen how the movie ends. Those who don't know the future always jump and lose peace with God. But those who are secure on a firm foundation of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ, they're not jumping. They're not worried. They're not glitchy. They're not like, oh, I'm, not I'm not walking around eggshells anymore. I'm not going to be a lifelong slave. I'm not afraid of death because I am a son of God. You need that assurance today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. You say, Pastor Mike, that's me. Far from God. I need peace with God. I need peace with God today. I've never had peace with God. I want the peace of God, but I know that I have to have peace with God before that. I want to give you assurance of salvation through Christ Jesus today at all of our locations and those that are joining us online, if that's you today and you say, I need this peace with God. I am not, I am restless. I, I am not assured. I do not know where my faith is at. And I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. If you want peace with God today, would you just raise your hand all across this room? I just want to pray for you, praying 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 for you, hands everywhere, praying for you. Thank you, Jesus. You have peace with God. Peace with God is instantaneous. You've been made right. Your faith in Christ has redeemed you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank God for all the hands that were just raised at all of our locations. You no longer have to worry. You can have assurance of your salvation. You can have assurance that justification is a firm foundation. Thank you, God. For those who just raised their hands, we're all going to pray this prayer together, everyone at the sound of my voice, as a family, to welcome you into the firm foundation that is peace with God. Say this. Say, Father God, I give my life to you. Thank you for establishing.
peace with you through Christ Jesus, your son. I repent and I commit to following you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's clap our hands. Welcome all those to the family of God.